So Brad, this morning as I was making coffee before we recorded, I was uh, pouring the coffee and updating all of my iOS devices simultaneously. Yes, as one does in the year 2023. It, just a perfectly normal thing to do. And I was thinking, you know, it would be nice if this update had happened last night automatically without me having to think about it. And also if I had a coffee refractometer so I could see how well I was extracting my coffee. Again, normal morning thoughts for 730 in the morning. This is just the way my brain works. I, I can't, uh, I, I feel like I want to dig into both of these, but I don't know where to start. So I'm going to leave it up to you. It's a choose your own adventure, Dude, Brad. That exploit was a rude awakening at 630 this morning when I first read about it. Holy. It. You mean, hey, let me send you an image and it will, it will totally pwn your phone. It's 12 o'clock. Do you know where your iPhone is? Did you know, I learned, I didn't know about lockdown mode on iPhones until then. No, I didn't either. We should step back and just talk about there. There's a very bad iOS exploit in the wild now. It's uh, it, I think it affects everything. iOS, uh, Mac, Mac OS, Macs, yeah, so it's, the it's whole like, thing, all Apple stuff. So update your Apple devices today. The distinction is <laughs> and it's right here in italics. I've, I've not heard of the Citizen Lab. Are you familiar with them? Yeah, they do. They do like they're they're a public service. This is how they build themselves. I, I gather they're one of these these kind of watchdog groups that identifies CVEs. Well, there's there's money in bug bounties, right? Uh, like, yes. like big big companies pay a lot of money for people who find new exploits and stuff like that. Yes. And, and you can fund a business that way. Yes. So even they, in their disclosure, have this in in italics. The exploit is capable of compromising iPhones running the latest version of iOS italics without any interaction from the victim. Yeah. Like that's you the just, part. That's yeah. the part. That's the part that makes this so crazy. I don't think I've ever seen an exploit where you didn't have to like click on or activate or run something malicious actively before you were exploited. But oh, Brad, let me tell you about the the great worm uh, uh, situation of the early 2000s. Pre well, okay. Windows XP SP2. <laughs> Look, you could just plug a computer on the on the mm -hmm. open network and it would be infected in like eight minutes. We've talked about this before. If yeah. you're going to run on the Internet without a firewall, there's no helping you. <laughs> it was a gentler time. OK, yes. Um, but yeah, like this is literally if you get an, an infected iMessage, your phone is compromised. That's it. Yeah. Like all they have to do is send you the right payload through an iMessage and you're fucked. Yeah. So up to, so if you're listening to this on Monday, it's probably already too, too late. You should probably just light your phone on fire at this point. Heck. Hack uh, the planet. No, it's like it's whatever. I mean, you'd have to be actively targeted. Like this yeah. is probably something that only public figures need to worry about. But, but really, it's probably something mostly that only like people who run afoul of nation states have to worry about. But still, it's bad. Well, I mean, you say that, but unlike most other exploits of this variety, this one they did find in the wild. So it's bad. Like like it's out there. They discovered this one because of someone's phone that they analyzed that had already been infected by it. Um, On the other side of this. The coffee refractor is a thing that you put a little drop of coffee and it tells you how many like what the percentage of solids is. It's in the device. Dude, that's some Star Trek shit. I've just been thinking about that as I continue to dabble with um, cold brew coffee. And I have cut caffeine mostly entirely out of my life. Oh, God, I'm sorry. That's uh, it's for the best. It's for the best. Well, let's say we have so much caffeinated coffee left that I'm still I, I, I flouted your advice and bought a five pound bag of decaf. Yeah. How's and that I'm, going for you? That's fine so far. Okay. Anyway, I'm I'm cutting now. I'm cutting like decaf and caffeinated. So, <laughs> so it's just another variable in the chain of what am I getting out of this cold brew? You know, it's like so. It's funny because the last time I looked at this, getting a refractometer was like a better part of a thousand bucks, and now now <sighs> there are some some that are like eighty bucks on Amazon Whoa. from China. Okay. And I'm like, maybe I'm going to get one of these. Seems like a quite, what, what, what's, what is there? Is there a bad idea? Well, this one's like a visual one that you look through. What are we getting out of this? Like caffeine, caffeine content, like oil solids, com composition. Solids, dis solids dissolved in the water. Like oh, that's how, it? how much stuff is in the water. It's yeah. just, just, just kind of how saturated is this liquid? It lets you know how much you've extracted out of the beans and into okay. the, into the, into the coffee. But you don't know what compounds or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, you, well, if you ground up coffee and put it in the water, you know that it's coffee compounds. Okay, fine. <laughs> it's not like a spectrometer that'll tell you this is this much carbon and this much uh, phosphate and well, this much. Look, look I, I, I can't tell you that it's some sort of magically corrosive argon gas, Brad. <laughs> I don't fine. understand that. I I don't, I'm mainly just curious how much caffeine yeah. is ending up in there, but uh, I, I'm sure that there's some sort of calculation you can do based on the, but, but that I think you have to do know how much caffeine's in the beans and that varies from varietal to varietal, I believe. So anyway, there you go. Uh, refractometers, update your iOS devices. It sounds like it's time for a podcast. <laughs> Well,
Welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad. I'm Brad. I'm Will. Okay. <laughs> just, just, just in case it didn't take the first time. Sorry about this. Look, school has started now. Okay. And as a result, in, like during the summer months, when we podcast, we often podcast early in the morning and I get Ooh. up and I have the house all to myself. I have an hour and a half usually before we go where I can like f- finalize show notes and I can get my stuff together and like have some have a little bit of quiet will time is to that, prepare for a pod. Sorry, is that I started to say, wait, are they like leaving for summer camp at 6 a.m.? But then it occurred to me, oh, they're probably still asleep. Like, yeah, everybody for, else like, is the, still I, asleep. The, the idea of sleeping past like six o'clock is hard for me to fathom oh. at this point. All the decent people in my house are asleep until yes, nine during the sounds, summer. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice for them. Uh, so now during this, the winter months when school's on, everything starts at 630 mm-hmm. and it's full chaos for an hour and a half. Sure. And they leave at about 750. So that means that I have 10 minutes instead of the <laughs> traditional 90 minutes to to, to to do my pod paration. Well, right. Look, you've, you've done <laughs> done some pretty good pod paration here in 10 to 15 minutes yeah so anyway there there we go uh this week we're going to talk about the kind of stuff that people don't talk about about making video games often Mm -hmm. um working in a small studio i've gotten to engage with some of this not all of this for sure you make it sound so salacious what what do you mean it's the stuff nobody talks about it's the filthy underpinnings (laughs) of the game industry Talk about dirty such secrets we don't want to hear about, like Perforce servers, and talk about talk talk about such scandalous subjects as your build server. Yeah, you uh, want to come down to Team City with me, Brad? Mm, Team City makes the build server software that we use. I don't wait. I'm sorry. What is it called? Team, Team City. Oh, I thought you were. I thought that was a Microsoft Teams joke. No, no, we use Teams too. We love Teams. It's a fine Seattle studio. We team nothing better than a good Microsoft product. Oh, is that a oh Team City is a JetBrains thing? Team City is a JetBrains thing. I, they make I, uh, they it's the uh, that is literally the, okay. So anyway, we're gonna yes. talk about we're gonna talk about the things that are like the back end stuff that makes game studios work yeah. and that make yes. it easy to publish games. Or, um, or as I like to think of it, the like we're gonna talk about how you build a video game, not how you like develop and make a video game, but how like you turn all that yeah. work into a functional running program. Yeah. So so for. So, for example, when I make a change to the sound stuff in the game, I submit it to our our source control software. We, we use Perforce. It's popular in the games industry. We'll talk about that in a minute. The um, the the then that goes up onto the source control server, and at some point in the future, somebody will say, "Okay, hey, well, or realistically, every night at three a.m." Our build servers look at the at the source control stuff and they, they're like, hey, has any, did anybody submit anything today? If they did, then we'll make a new build. And if not, then we'll just use yesterday's build stays. Um, and then those get built. They get uploaded to Steam. And the next morning, our, our internal branches are updated with like the latest uh, daily playtest build, which oh, is wow. which is. Uh, which is our like the current the, it's it's equivalent of a nightly in like a I was, yeah. open source. Absolutely. Context. I, I was I. I started so i'm sure every studio is different i'm like shocked to hear it's that automated not the build process because of course you why not automate nightly builds yeah the part, the part where you deploy it to steam even though i'm sure that's like filtered to a few testers like not that's certainly not for public consumption but the idea that the idea that a build is going out the door even to testers without anybody touching it is kind of crazy to me well so that internal build is just internal like no, we, that's we not even for that's not even for external testers we don't generally okay we have in the past made those builds available to inter, external testers but so so there's more okay let's take it let's <laughs> take a step let's take, take a step back okay most studios probably have at least two and probably three to five private builds or f- f- plus the release the release build that everybody uh, that everybody that's bought the game has access to so there's like there's going to be a debug slash development build that has all the hooks that people can hook their their engine tools into to see like what's going on inside the game right and that you don't want to put out there's usually like if it's a multiplayer game there's like a staging environment or a development environment one where you can hook into the server and see the same stuff sometimes those are the same build in our in our game they are um there's a private testing pre-release like a release candidate build that's essentially a ready to ship to machines build so so there's development builds there's testing builds and then there's builds that you give to to, to customers to players and 
there are different divisions inside use. Usually the testing one has some debug hooks and will dump extra debug stuff. It may have cheats enabled so that the QA folks can can bypass like you know, can spawn specific weapons. Like if there's a change to a weapon, you want to spawn like 50 of those and try in a right. bunch of different cir- circumstances, stuff like that. Yeah. And in multiplayer game, you obviously don't want to leave that stuff in for the shipping build. Um, and then, and then there's the shipping builds and the shipping Canada builds and all that stuff. Yeah. I've, the, the, this is just kind of tangential, like having covered console games for a long time. I've always assumed that's why, or that's a big part of the re- the debug stuff is a big part of the reason that console dev kits are so much beefier than the actual console hardware, because you need a ton, ton of extra memory and maybe extra compute to handle all the crazy extra debug stuff you have to run on top of the actual game. That's my understanding of that. Um, it's that's a double edged sword because you can use debug kits to test. But you uh, we, we like we had a bug with one of the Xboxes, I think, that was, it was only it didn't happen on the debug kits because they had that extra memory. That's, that's I was going to say. It seems like you'd have to do some very meticulous like resource and performance profiling to make sure you're not exceeding your, your eventual hardware target budget. We we did not realize that that was a pro- <laughs> well, uh, so we didn't realize it was a problem when we were testing because we assumed that when you flip those to retail mode, then they work like retail kits, but they don't. That's, uh, anyway. that, that sounds like in an Xbox context because that's the only one that's got modes of that nature. I believe so. Yeah, okay. but that's we only ship on Xbox. So, yeah. um, uh, so OK, so you have all these different things. Each of those is a pipeline in your in your build server. Right. And and uh, the build server has basically all of the stuff on it that you need to make the game, either the debug versions, the testing versions, the shipping versions, whatever, um, and on all the platforms that you release. So like it'll have all of the libraries and all of the compiler stuff. And, and what, what it has on it varies widely based on your game, the platforms you ship on, whether it's a, a console game or a PC game, whatever. Um, but the build server knows like, hey, grab these commits, do um do, uh, good, hook into the different API versions and then you need to make a version for Steam you need to make a version for Epic you need to make a version for the Xbox One for Xbox Series for Windows Store all the places you might ship the game it'll it'll build those and each of those takes time like it's yeah. a it's a fairly involved process God I've got I could probably spend the rest of this podcast talking to you about the your build server and the concept in general from from everything from like the general specs and and how they're built at a, at a low level to like how you manage different build environments based on compile targets and platforms and stuff like that. Like are most, I'm sure it varies. Like, you know, I'm trying to think like, what's the biggest Ubisoft team out there. I mean, your studio is quite small. A lot lot of indie developers are just a single digit number of people, but then there are like hundreds strong studios out there, like 500 people or something these days or or Bungie is like gigantic. Right. So like, I'm sure, I'm sure what constitutes like a build server or build farm, is very different uh, as as size scales. Yeah, we have a baby ass baby build I, farm. It's only like three machines. I was, oh, even though I'm I, I'm actually surprised even at, at your size that it's multiple machines. I was going to ask like, is it is it all just kind of I assume off the shelf commodity hardware these days? I mean, CPUs are very fast in general, right? Or, yeah, I think um, I feel like more cores and more memory. It's a real right turn intensive thing. My guess is like we've been looking at upgrading our build servers at some point in the future um, just because we're on at the time we built these machines or bought these machines. I don't think that there were a lot of really large NVMe SSDs available at, at a scale that we could so, okay, so you have to have a lot like the the there's a lot of space. The, it requires a lot of space. So if you like our game is like 16 gigs on Steam, which decompresses down to like 30 gigs when when you when you unpack it. Um, and to do the builds and have you have to have all the source code files, you have to have the compiled binary assets f- that make up the game in the Unreal project, all that stuff. It's it's big. It's like 500 gigs of space for the project. Uh, for the current that's, version of the project. That's, that's pretty big. Yeah. For, um, I mean, you know, like a, a relatively small scale game. I'm not saying like your game is small yeah, or whatever, but like, our but budget like was it's like $8 for, million. Dollars. Right, it's not it's a like, big game. Right. Yeah. Like it's a focused game. It's a multiplayer only game more or less, you know, like yeah, that's, yeah. And that, and that's, that's like you said, that's half a terabyte for a, an indie multiplayer game. <laughs> like yeah. Imagine, imagine what the, the total kind of asset or, or package size is for like your average sprawling console RPG. Yeah, to give you some context, I think Chet likes to say that um, Far Cry 6 had more studios that worked on it than we had people that worked on the Anacrusis. <laughs> sure. 
Um, and and some of those studios, like the Ubisoft Shanghai, is like a thousand people. It's Jeez. they're enormous, right? Yeah. So so they have a whole like where we had a person who did this for a while and then it shifted out to like to be part of somebody else's job or a couple other people's jobs. This this. At some place like Ubisoft, I assume that there's entire teams that do nothing but this kind of DevOps work, right? Where sure. they're, where they're, you know, everybody has their own per force and then stuff filters up and their nightlies are real weird, I'm sure. I, I don't even, like, I can't even, the amount of art that goes into something like an Assassin's Creed, I don't, I, I can't imagine that you have a daily build cycle. And then, and then you hear about things like Destiny 1 where Bungie didn't, had problems with their back end and like they had a their their the, just to be clear the build server doesn't do the computationally expensive stuff like build light maps and stuff like that that happens either an artist does that or we have a build a light map machine that that does that interesting um, so what are what what are when you say an artist does that do they would they have that hard that surely they wouldn't have that hardware at their desk right i assume that's like heavier iron than like would be in an end user context no, um okay or, so for our like, game or, for it, again this is a place where things differ based on yeah. the scale of your game right yeah. on our game i i can run the light maps in like 40 minutes on my oh. 4090 oh okay because they're they're a gpu the, there's a gpu accelerated oh, of light course, map maker of now course. see my my brain is very stuck in the 90s back when like every every like quake licensee had a had a like a, a, a you light map. Have an sgi machine in right. any place running like, this like, stuff like running radiosity calculations yeah no i mean that the, like, the ray tracing stuff has accelerated that pretty dramatically sure. it's not it's not real time but it's like it's gone from a hey you start this before you leave work at the end of the day and then you come back in the morning and it's maybe done to okay. hey you can hit the button can, and yeah like on a 3070 it'll be done in like a, an hour okay you can go you eat know. lunch and come back yeah, you and go eat lunch little. maybe take a nap yeah i guess i guess this is a good time to point out like the stuff we're talking about in terms of how fast you can you know crunch calculations and, and produce a build like that has very real implications for workflow right like how fast you can check changes in and get a build out and test them like just dictates how fast you can move on to the next thing right yeah and and so we have so so the two things to take away from this are even a simple game that's only shipping on two platforms. We ship on Steam and Xbox right now. When we release something, it makes five builds, right? Huh, okay. So each of those builds takes an hour to two hours. A lot of that is just disk churn. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of complicated stuff. It's not like we're making light maps or something on all of those builds. And like that takes that takes a long time. We also have a hey, here's we want to do something quick for testing that just jams it up on on a special Steam branch, and that's like an hour, hour and a half. But it's it still takes time. It's a it's upload bandwidth and it's um it's it's the compiling time and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I assume it's it's probably safe to say that the common commercial engines like Unreal and Unity have I assume have focused on iteration time as a. As oh, a I don't point. think they give a flying no. fuck about iteration time. <laughs> Okay, never mind then. Well, you you mentioned the Bungie example, which like, from my understanding, that was just like a legacy tech issue. You know, they had just been working on the same core yeah. architecture in their engine for so long that there were just a lot of legacy things that made it because that that was very widely reported about the first game that like, you know, like kind of like you said, yeah, it took 12 you, hours to you, make a, to, to see a map change like or something, something nuts, right? Right. Like replace one pickup in the map. I'm, I, this may not be hundred percent accurate, but it will like, make a very minor change to the map. And then you have to wait like all night and come back the next morning before you can test the map again. Yeah, I, th I think so. Um, I don't know about Bungie's example in particular, but, uh, but, um, the other thing is, so I, I, I say that I don't think the, the engine makers give a fuck about that, but like there is, Unreal has play an editor, right? So you can hit a button in the game and it'll load up the game with whatever kind of starting state you say. So you can say, okay, I want to play in versus mode. I want to play in survival mode. I want to do this, this, this. And then you can play through the game the editor. It's not exactly one to one. Like there's some places where it's a little bit weird. Um, and, and you can get, you can put yourself in trouble there. But if you're making like, if you're making like, for example, when I'm making audio changes, I can make my change, hit the play and editor button and and get an idea a pretty good idea of what the end result is going to be you mean, you mean when you're getting your wise on when i'm getting my wise on um if other stuff is less like light map changes you still have to make the light maps if you want to see what what happens and there's always a did this did this run right or is there some weird math glitch did a cosmic ray hit the gpu at the wrong moment and jack up the whole thing Whoa. um but but that usually results in like weird artifacting not um not a broken build not a broken build the 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 thing about the thing about 
like light maps are a weird one because it's always a balance between, hey, how long do I want to bake the light map? And hey, what level of janky artifacting am I okay with in a shadow in a corner of the map that nobody ever sees? And it turns out the answer is you're probably okay with a little bit of artifacting in a weird corner that nobody ever sees. Sure. Um, and if that's a continual problem, you can put something in that corner that will kind of fix that problem and tell it to spend a little more time there. I don't, I don't know if this is getting too like 3D graphics engineering for you or if you can speak to this, but like, can you elaborate on like what constitutes a light map in 2023? Like I, I hear a lot about light probes. Like are those synonymous at this point? Like I don't know what the, and, and, are, and also are we talking about fully static lighting at this point? Like are, are those types of quote unquote light maps like things that you place and then don't move like is that still how does that how does that work these days yeah so um depending on the platforms you're shipping on for example like if you're making an oculus quest game you, you can have a relatively meager number of dynamic lights dynamic lights are lights that can move that can be on or, or well i mean light map lights can be on or off too but the, the upshot they're is very in intensity you move around stuff like that yeah they're they're you can you Change can color. affect them programmatically during yes. the gameplay and th they are on traditional hardware, very expensive. Like the, 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 they call it, especially on mobile stuff. They're yeah. really expensive to yeah. run, which is why I like lighting has been like the, the, it's hard to say the Holy grail, but that's more like the white whale. I feel, I feel like of, of 3d graphics since the beginning of time, right? Like that's always the thing that takes the most work and that people throw the most different like techniques at the wall to try to solve. Well, and it's, and it's a thing that our brains, our brains know what lights do, what light does in the real right. world, just right. instinctively, we understand it. So it's a place where when the light doesn't look right, you know it and you're like, this doesn't look good or, or, or it's alternately, you can go with a really stylized approach and then you, it doesn't matter if it looks good. You just have to be internally consistent. Um, the, 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 the. There's a bunch of different ways to cheat having a bunch of dynamic lights in the game. That's that's the kind of TLDR and the different engines use a bunch of different ways inside an engine. You can choose to use a bazillion different ways. The exciting. This is one of the reasons people are excited about UE5 is that because of the things that they're doing you can have dynamic like dynamic lights because of the way they're using the ray tracing hardware and 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 some stuff that they've done on the back end of the engine dynamic lights as a solution for your game are much more viable than they have been in the past so you can have a game that is entirely dynamic lights like the sky the sun is a dynamic light and and like for, so for example in PUBG, the sun moves across the sky right but they move the sun across the sky by generating light maps at all the different positions that the sun can be and then blending between them as the time changes in the game yeah is that why in, in some games you'll if you look at kind of the, the shadows on the ground you'll see them moving in very rigid increments yeah yeah. And, and so they don't blend between them when they're moving in rigid increments. Right, right. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, all a light map is, is a texture that says how bright a part of the map is. Right. Right. Um, and, and then the light probes and stuff like that are just, just further refined, give you more control over specific subsets of the game and stuff like that, or, yeah. or dynamic control over different areas, stuff like that. Right. So like fully, fully not to turn this into lighting chat, but like fully generalized dynamic lighting has all that's, that's the Holy grail that I was talking about. Like ever since like doom three, it's always been, like different techniques of chasing like we don't want to have to bake any any rigid unchangeable lights into this game if we can make everything work in the same way dynamically then yeah or even, or even in different ways dynamically and, and typically game lighting doesn't work the same way that light works in the real life yeah. in, re in real life you know a light source exudes photons the photons bounce off of things and then the photons that smash into your eyeballs are are represent colors and and right. and information right and like their it, wavelength has changed based on what they've been absorbed and re-emitted yeah uh, into in, in a video game typically they you blast rays out from the eyeballs and you see what you yeah. can see and then you uh, kind of back you reverse engineer into what color those should be yes i was gonna bring that up. i was I've, as as i've read a little bit about the current ray tracing techniques i was surprised to find out that they do it in reverse of the way that that it works in the well, real it turns world out it's a lot cheaper because you don't yeah. have to do a bunch of pixels a, a bunch of rays that nobody ever sees yes so like that stuff is super fascinating and i could barely speak to it although i was actually just looking at the Reister white paper yesterday are you familiar mm -hmm. with that I haven't read it yet. Uh, it's, it. it's what Cyberpunk uses for their path tracing mode. It's a it's a relative. I think his white paper was published in like 2019, 2020. It's just a new it's a new algorithm for ray casting that is like wildly more efficient. It's uh -huh. Probably it's probably like less accurate if you're running an offline render farm and you want pure pure image yeah. quality. Yeah, but Pixar's like, not going to use that, but it's great for video games. It sounds yeah, it, like it, R E S T I R. Like it's the math is super over my head. I didn't even bother trying to understand it. But if you if you Google that, you'll get straight to the NVIDIA like research page for it. And you can see a picture of like, 
here's 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 the kind of like it's not a point cloud but what is the you know the the undenoised like just the the speckled image that you see of like yeah. here's here's where every ray hit a surface with the traditional algorithm and then right next to what Reser does and it's like orders of magnitude more samples more so, dense yeah so it's cool it's really cool seeing all this research stuff going on that's like massively accelerating how that stuff works we're let's we should probably get back to building games i'm sorry well, yeah. to turn this no, into three no, no. graphics so, so, time well so the, the i mean that's why we don't focus too much on stuff like light maps like we we set up a big thread ripper machine in the office and okay let that be the light so, map server and then and then the artist can say okay i need to bake level you know episode three level two and that sends a command to that server and it runs the light maps and like an hour later it uploads it it makes a commit to the source control that's like hey new light maps for episode three level two um that's okay that's interesting so that's that's what i was wondering about when i said like are is are these types of servers just commodity hardware these days like threadripper is not exactly end user hardware but it's also not like it's also not a hundred thousand dollar so supercomputer type stuff like you like you said that's like what is like a decent threadripper build is like five grand or something yeah i don't think we even spent that much um, okay but but yeah basically the build servers will benefit from more cores, yeah. but you don't need like a workstation, like a multi-core workstation machine. You just need something with a shitload of core. You just like a Threadripper or a big Intel machine will totally do it. Um, and you're probably better off given that while one build is building, like we would be better off having four small machines than two big machines. I think we have two big machines now. And because we have f- five builds to make when we hit the button, then and they can't run in parallel on the same machine, we would be better off having five NUCs with a lot of storage attached <laughs> to them uh-huh. than two big 64 core machines, which is what we have now. So where are those two machines not in some kind of cluster situation where they're both working on the same? Are, are, is each one doing a discrete build? Each one build? is doing a, its own build because of the way the build process. You can't come. Yeah. They, but like, I guess theoretically we could put VMs on them, but also you pay for Team City based on the number of machines that you have. So like it's it, the, 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 as with everything, you can put a bunch of numbers in a spreadsheet and then you get a curve where you're like, OK, here's the sweet spot. We're willing to pay this much money a year to get a build in an hour versus a third of that to get a, a build in two hours right sure, and sure. it turns out the two hour number is usually the right number yes um okay so then once the builds are made on the build server theoretically if you've done if you set yourself up right it should just go to the platforms like mm-hmm. it should just be uploaded into the back ends of the platforms <laughs> disclaimer uh so uh some are more reliable than others okay there's a button in Team City that you can press that's like, hey man, re- rerun the upload process. So oh, so Team sorry. City Team City sets this up as like I, I've used Jenkins before in the past, which is a similar piece of software that's open source. But Team City sets this up as a series of tasks. So it's like build for Steam, build for Xbox, build for Xbox One, build for Windows. And then it's then the next, then it has an the next step in that chain is deploy to Microsoft, deploy to Steam. So like if the build completes correctly and it doesn't deploy, you just hit the, the deploy button and it uploads it again and it's fine. Okay. I didn't realize Team City also handled the uploads and like hooked, hooked into those backends directly. Is that built in or is that something that you have to like script? Like here's, 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 here's the upload target for Steam. Here's like the API keys. Like do you have to kind of like build that part yourself? Sort so, of? so yeah, I didn't set this up on our end. Um, I did it for our Jenkins server rooms at foo, but, but basically like steam, steam stuff is probably, um, steam just has a bunch of command line utilities that you, you, you can script into. So it's a lot of PowerShell scripting, right? And from team city's perspective, this is, all just PowerShell scripting and it has hooks into some of the compilers and stuff like that. So you can see how it's going, but mostly it's just like, Hey, I'm going to run some scripts in a sequence of orders. And then I'm also going to archive a bunch of files for you. I know how to handle the file archiving bits, but also that's probably PowerShell scripting too. I haven't actually looked at those to see how they work, but it's basically when you're setting up a small game studio, it's good to have one person who's really excited about doing PowerShell scripting. (laughs) Oh, huh. yeah, you don't say Well, because all this stuff has to run on Windows, right? You yeah. you run this on Windows because that's where your environment is. And, the, you know, if you're shipping to Xbox, I guess you have to eh, they probably let you build on Linux now. But, yeah, but was, realistically, uh, you're going to run on Windows for most yeah, of this. If you're a, if you're a small studio, that makes sense. I, I wonder, I mean, if, if anybody, any game devs listening to this, I wonder, I want to write in. I wonder if if the WSL2 changes that at all. Like if 
Linux build environment on Windows is more viable now that that's a factor. So we set that stuff up. Well, you could definitely build a Linux build on Windows. Oh, like uh, we, Linux build, yes. We I'm could build a Linux build, no problem if we wanted. It's uh, we, supporting uh, a Linux build is a whole other issue. No, no, I meant I meant like managing your whole build and environment. That, that probably doesn't make sense. Like you probably you want to build for, you you want to build for the OS on the OS, right? Yeah, I don't know what the Unreal Linux situation is. I know like that they have a Linux pipeline, but I bet it's I bet it's from Windows. I don't I don't know. I haven't looked at that. But, but supporting Linux is a is fraught with peril. Yeah. Um. I like I love Linux as next as much as the next person. I think everybody knows that. But the, the beautiful thing this team has done is let us support Linux without having to actually test more stuff. Yeah. Because because the other thing is each of these builds adds testing overhead, right? Like every time you make a new version of the game that you have to release to people, you have to test stuff and and um you know, with a small team <laughs> testing five versions of the game, even, even just to test the stuff that we change from build to build. So that's, that's, um, we've kind of gone a little bit out of order here, but, but, uh, you, you, you just, even just testing the stuff you change is a huge task, right? If you, if you have a patch that has 20 changes and you have five versions, that means you have to test those 20 changes on five different builds of the game and, and see, what works and what doesn't and if there's any weird regressions and like it's 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 complicated do you um do you as a studio have like a standard suite of tests outside outside of like you said like if you change five things of course you have to test those five things but like is there also like just a, a short checklist of like these are the basics we have to recon reconfirm every single time there's a new build that these work or well, that would be a good idea <laughs> okay i mean obviously that's limited by that's constrained by resources and and human human power yeah, I mean, we do have a list of things that we test, um, but I mean, also the game's early access. So like if we were releasing, it's it, we're a relatively small game. We're in mm -hmm. early access mm -hmm. and also we move, we can move quickly so we can release a follow up patch within a day, basically. Yeah. So we typically ask our, our wonderful community of players to help with that kind of stuff and let us know if we've done something really bad because, because the, the, the challenge of, Hey, if we change something about the way matchmaking works, it has, we can test matchmaking a little bit internally, but not really. We can't test across regions and stuff like that because we only have people in the United States. So, so it's, it's difficult for us to, um, to find out if we've actually messed something up with matchmaking until it's actually on the live game is right. the unfortunate thing. Right. And my, my assumption is, you know, like people might be listening and thinking like, well, if you only change five things, why do you have to test anything other than five things? But <clears throat> my assumption is that it's very hard to predict second and third order consequences of seemingly, I mean, it's straight up a butterfly flaps its wings yeah. on map two and so, type stuff. I don't know. So yeah, a lot of stuff's interconnected. A lot of stuff's like, for example, the attenuation profiles for environment sounds in the game are often shared across levels, which is some a choice somebody made a long time ago that is seems crazy now. Because <laughs> it haunt, means that haunts I can, you to this day. Yeah, it means that if I change how far away you can hear a fan on level one of episode one, then all of a sudden a big huge blower on episode five or four is gonna sound like a jet engine and I won't know it until I play episode four three days later. Um the 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 better example of that probably is something like um the player's collision capsule had to change a few months ago and that given the, the, so whoever wrote the ai code for the bots you know when when a player gets gooed in our game gets incapacitated you shoot them to knock the goo off of them and free them and the person who wrote the bots was like oh the player collision capsule is a little bit off so i'll just aim at the, the 20 pixels right 20 units right of the collision capsule in cartesian space to, to free them when they get good and it'll just work itself out. And that was great until we fixed the collision capsule. And now all the bots are shooting 20 units to the right of where the, where the, where the player actually is. So the bots just don't ever, un, don't ever free players anymore. Great. Great. And like, how do you, I mean, we find that out cause we play every day. Yeah. That's a bad example of that. But like if, if that was a, uh, you know, and if we change something about the way you invite friends to the game on Steam and that had knock on effects on Xbox, we might not think to check that because it like, who knows? Anyway, um, so that's that's what build servers do. Like they they make the game, they turn the code into game and then they push the game to the server. If you set it to the platforms and, and then from there, you can go to a UI thing and push the build live where you yeah. open up a web interface someplace. And you're like, OK, I want this upload to be the live game on servers right now. I I. 
I want to ask more about the build process. I don't want to get too much into the weeds. And I also don't know how much of it you set up yourself. But. I didn't set up any of the build <clears> process. <throat> I, I just, I didn't know how to go in and press the button to make a build. Uh, maybe, maybe that answers, answers the question. Cause I was going to ask if there is just a button to press, at least with unreal these days, like you're not necessarily running. Like I'm, I'm curious about like which compiler is being used and like, what's the build environment and the tool chain look like and stuff. But I'm guessing that at least, at least with a commercial engine, that's probably all pretty much dictated and set up by the engine. Yeah, so that's all Unreal stuff. We ha we use um, some of the stuff we use, like the, the like the different APIs that we use from Microsoft for the Xbox stuff and all that have different requirements for like Visual C and X and A or X and whatever that whatever the current Xbox backend stuff is called that whatever their API package is called, um, and and the that's all set up in the scripts for the compiling scripts that we that with the building scripts that that somebody set up for Team City two years ago at this point probably three years ago. Interesting. Like um, like there's there's you know there there are starting to be some open source game engines out there now, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm sure those types of questions are maybe more relevant there. I mean I'm sure they automate some of that stuff too, but like um, well so this is just to be clear this is an Unreal automation. This is stuff that we built internally. This oh. is why you, this is why having like Team City is a cert product we pr we pay for that right. takes the stuff that I like I could build just to be clear I could load up my computer in Unreal right now and hit a button that says hey make that make an Xbox version of this game and I guess I don't have Visual C installed but if I did Visual Studio installed if I did then I could make a version of the game that I could upload to the Microsoft backend or to Steam and people would be able to play I see okay but in order to do that, it's going to type my computer for an hour and a half. Right. And then I'm going to have to manually upload it. And actually, Steam doesn't let you upload stuff bigger than a certain size. So I'd have to get the Steam command line tool to upload it and like all the credentials and all that stuff. So so this is a this is a way to manage like what, what a build server does is gives you a way to make those builds without having to give everybody in the organization the Steam keys and the Xbox keys and all the crypto stuff that you need to sign the Xbox games and all that stuff. So it, it lets you keep your information secure that's important to the to the to the thing but also more widely distribute the ability yeah. to actually make the game that's super interesting just one person yeah that, that's fascinating to think about steam as a development tool in that context and not as an end user distribution platform like like yeah like for for like you said kind of build build management and and dispersal to people who don't need necessarily need to worry about that sort of thing on the well, team and it's also worth mentioning that steam is really neat because they give you the ability to put infinite well they get they a they let developers hand out keys without having to pay for them or something like stupid like that uh b they they also let you do branches so you can do betas and stuff like that that are either public or private people use them for all sorts of interesting stuff like the other day i was poking around dead cells and they have in their in their beta branches uh public versions of every past version of dead huh. cells i think is in there wow so if you want to go back and play launch dead cells you can oh, that's cool yeah um like if you have a server backend infrastructure obviously that's not going to work but but like you can do whatever you want when we wanted to test um when we wanted to test versus publicly like semi-publicly we could just generate a branch with a passcode on it and share that with the community and then people can load load it up and play the game yeah yeah, the 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 like all the Steam developer docs largely are public. You can go read about a lot of that stuff. Like I've I've looked into some of how the back end branching stuff works and like they give you an amazing amount of granular control over like who has access to a given branch and, and stuff like that. Yeah, and and um it, like it's up to us then to make sure that we don't share, for example, the branch with the developer credentials or the, the you know, whatever, whatever that kind of stuff is in there. Yeah. Um, uh, and, real, and, real quick, real yeah. quick before we move on, just to, to touch on a couple of the um, open source uh, game engines that I mentioned. Godot is the big one that I hear about for the uh -huh. most part. G-O-D-O-T. Yeah, um, we're waiting for it still. Yes. <laughs> I bet they get that a lot. Look, they named the game That's, engine. It's you know, their own fault. I guess you I guess you you may have a point there. It's um, it's not like me where I was named Will Smith and then twenty years later somebody got famous. They knew what Godot was when they named it that. Yes. Uh I, I see. I mean, I, I don't know if this is true or I can't say for sure this is true, but I kind of see Godot spoken about a lot in the context of like Unity. Like I see a lot of like every time Unity does something unpopular, I'll see some game developers on Twitter say, like, well, maybe it's time to finally start learning Godot. So I wonder if it has similar application or similar amount of scope. I would say um, disaffection with unity seems to be pretty high in my communities <laughs> right now. Okay. Um, I don't know that I, I, I haven't looked at Godot yet. I don't know where Godot's okay. at. Uh, there's also Bevy, which don't know about that one. I think is, is pretty, 
I shouldn't say limited. I don't, I, I get the sense it's fairly early. It's written in rust. Okay. Um, and I've, there's some, some people on our discord have spoken highly of it, or at least have, I think, enjoyed tinkering with it. I, um, it, it's hard to not do a commercial product if you're spending like, like if you think about your investment in a commercial game engine versus, um, versus like the, the payroll of your small studio, even like with five or six people, like it's, it's scary to not have like, the, like, I don't know that Godot has a support infrastructure oh, no, no, around no, 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 it yeah, at I'm this not, point. That's adequate. To, abs- yeah. You yeah. absolutely, absolutely want like proper support, commercial support for something like that in an actual business. I, I, I was throwing that stuff out there more as a, as a, like, if you're curious about this stuff, here are a couple of free engines you can go oh, Google yeah. and download and mess with yourself if you just want to like kind of see how some of these pieces are put together. Well, I was gonna say also, I think I think both Unity and so one of the things that surprised me about all of this stuff is that at small scale, most of the software is relatively inexpensive or free. So for example, um our source control per force is free until you have more than five users. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you still have to pay for a server to host it and, and all, sure. or you have to host it yourself. I guess that's kind of, that's like been the model though, right? I, I didn't, did, did Unreal kick that off like 15-ish years, maybe 20? I feel like, like the, our- first, the first time they did them build something on real thing, after that, they announced that you could download it for free. Right. That and was, previously it had been like, you had to pay a million dollars to get access right. to Unreal. Right. Which was obviously smart. Like you want to put the tools in people's hands with a yeah. barrier to entry. And then once they start making money, you start taking some of that money. Um, I was going to say that one thing I forgot about on the build server front is that if you have internal tooling, the build server probably also manages and updates and distributes that to people. Okay. So for example, our, we have a custom version of unreal editor cause we, we modified our unreal editor to do things that were specific to the game. And when we update that, the build server does that. And then you run a batch file on your computer that downloads the latest version of it from a, from a server someplace. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, the, the 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 different game engines, like everybody always wants to talk about game engines. And it's funny because as I get as I'm further into this, like it's more and more clear that really the game engine matters way less than people think it yeah. does. Well, like, yeah, I'm sure on the developer side, it's just it's a means to an end, right? Like it's just a tool. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a, well, it's a toolbox, right? Well, yes, yes. Because like when you when you buy Unreal, you're getting the, all of their ter- op- like. If you want to make a big ass open world, turns out Unreal's pretty good at that because what Epic uses to ma- Unreal to make is a big ass open world game, right? Um, if you want to do destructible stuff, they're good at that. If you want to do, uh, if you want to ship stuff on mobile, maybe Unreal is not your choice, right? Like, like there are probably better choices than that. Uh, if you want to make a text adventure, o- Unreal probably massive overkill right you, there's much better choices for that but but it's it's there, there's a lot of um th- there's just a lot of options out there now which is i think good for everyone yeah yeah i mean a lot of that seems to have uh come from like youtube and i don't i don't know how to describe like forum chatter i guess it's like like kind of discussion among consumers and users about like which game looks better and runs better and what engine is it on? Oh, everybody should use that engine. Like it's just kind of a very reductive style of, of, of discourse. Like, I'm as guilty of this as the next person. Yeah, I did a, sure, what same. you need to know about game engines article in like 2005 yes. for maximum PC. Yes. And I was like, look, Gamebryo, really? They're doing some crazy stuff up there. Look at what the people in, in uh, Norway are doing at dice. They got cool things going. And then we all know how Frostbite turned out. So my bad. Um, but but yeah, it's 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 more like all those YouTube videos about oh I could tell this was a Unity game because it has the Unity look. What they're what they're identifying is hey these people use Unity's default lighting model right. and which is a fine choice. I I yeah I I don't know it's just YouTube I don't like YouTube discourse the older I get Brad. Um, Fair. Fair. Should we should we talk about uh, source control or yeah or I guess, QA I think, next? I think that was source control was the first topic, but we kind of blew past it a little bit. Yeah, but. it's fine. Well, we talk about per force. I mean, the interesting thing here with games to me is that like when I think about source control, it's a source. It's it's a method of versioning, right? Like just to be clear, it is a method of like keeping your code base in sync between multiple developers, man- yeah. managing changes and and versions that you can roll back to and et cetera, et cetera. But when I've always thought about source control, it's purely in the context of text files, which are code. Yeah. But then, but then like you mentioned, you've got like, you've got mass amounts of assets, sounds, 
uh, textures, sounds levels, like a mo- 3D models, models, models Maya like files, right? like and, and I, I and I'm sure this varies between studios, but I like I wonder how much I wonder what the trend is about like do does a single artist generally kind of have ownership of a model, for example, like a specific character model, or are there like a bunch of different artists working on the same model at different times? So I'm gonna say. Uh, well, generally, only one person can check something out at a time. That's no, like, I, I mean, I mean, successively, like, like, oh, like, I, I'm sure I'm sure it happens that maybe somebody else will go back and touch something up if somebody else is busy or whatever. I'm just wondering how much of those <laughs> types of assets need to also be versioned and controlled. All of them. Yeah. Because if you're spending money making them, you should version them. Yeah. Oh, of like, course. Like, yeah. like, like yeah. I, I, just realistically, if you have if you have cost in something, it should be on your perforce. Like we even keep marketing images on the perforce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I, that, I, I phrased that poorly. I meant more just I wonder how many different people are touching things that aren't because like code, you're constantly collaborating on with different people. So art and, is the same. Is, so okay. um, there are there. Are, I mean, it depends on the scale of your studio. If you're a one programmer, one artist studio, then one person's doing all the art. Right. Yeah. But if you have 10 people working on the game, then and, and eight of them are artists, then probably eight people will touch a lot of the six or eight people will touch a lot of the stuff in the game so for example um if you're talking about a character a character is a good example so if you want to make a new character for the game you have a concept artist probably that draws what draws pictures of what it looks what the character looks like shows them in some different positions shows some like potential animation ideas stuff like that uh then that person hands that that concept off to a character artist the character and often Oftentimes, especially at a small studio, the character artist, the concept artist will be somebody who also does other things. They do texture work or they do like punching up of environments or something like that. They're just they're just good at drawing, too. You get a twofer with that person if you're lucky. Um, Sometimes it's the character artist. Uh, The character artist will model that character out if it's a 3D game or draw sprites if it's a 2D game. And then. The character artist hands the model off to the to the technical artist. The technical artist rigs it so that it can move, so that it has you know, so you can hook it into the animation system of the game. And the technical artist hands it to the animator, and the animator puts the animations on. And that's a that's a a never ending job because you know there's thousands of anime like like we have dozens and dozens and dozens of stumble animations in our game for like aliens when they get shot, so that when you shoot them in the legs, they stumble appropriately. Um, the stumble artist has to take over at that point. It's so many think, stumbles, but, I mean, but I, yeah, I think that's where I was being reductive or overly simplifying the situation. I, I didn't, I guess I didn't realize all those disciplines had like abstracted out into different roles as much as they apparently have. Like I, I kind of was thinking of it from probably a very old fashioned, like full stack, like, well, you, you model it and then you animate it and then it's done. Right. But it sounds okay. like that those, those disciplines, I'm sure just like everything else, things get so complicated that they have to spin out into different roles. Right. Yeah. And each of those has different strengths, right? Like the person who's good at sculpting a, a soft body model is maybe not going to be great at, at figuring out how the movement should work for them. Right. Yeah. Like a- animating, animating is really hard. Yeah. Doing the rig is a technically challenging job that also requires people to, to like, like technical artist is one of those uh, technical artist is like associate editor in the publishing business, right? An associate editor, depending on which publish it, which, 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 whether you're at a magazine or website or what magazine or website you're at, an associate editor could be the lowest person on the totem pole, or it could be the person who does the vast majority of work on the publication, like the, the frontline work. And then all of their work gets filtered up through other people, right? Um, a technical artist is they can be doing rigs for character models or for anything that moves in the game. They can be writing shaders. They can be helping the vfx artist with with like with like writing scripts to 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 make the vfx work they can be hooking stuff like visual effects into the game right like they can be building particle systems or lighting models or all sorts like crazy crazy broad spectrum but a, a lot of that work is stuff like rigging skeletons on on and rigging rigging character meshes um anyway so yeah, everybody touches everything. And like when, it, when you get all that done, then an engineer has to hook it into the, into the game, like has to actually put it in and say, okay, this can be put in the spawn tables. Here's the AI for it. Here's the, here's the, here's the, 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 the gameplay designer will say, here's what it, what, okay. It has an attack. It has a ranged attack. Is it going to be a fireball? It's going to be an ice ball. Is it going to be a laser? Is it going to be him picking up rocks from the ground and throwing them at you? And, and like, so 20 people will touch that even if it's a 10 person studio somehow i don't know how that works but um that all makes sense so so you, you folks use perforce is, is that like super common would you say in game development so, so 
in in like tech world git is what people get get is what people seem to use um engineers like git because it's really good at doing code there's a lot of right. a lot of um uh, a lot of good command line tools so you can just jam out commits really fast right yeah I'm, I'm i'm thinking more once once a mass quantity of binary assets are also involved like like i like i said traditionally i think of of git as as a text only thing but but you've you've mentioned here github lfs is that a what is what is that yeah, so LFS is their binary is their binary tool. Okay, um, we used LFS at um, at Foo with, with kind of mixed results. It was fine. It was also brand new when we were using it at Foo, so I'm sure I'm sure it's come along uh, pretty nicely. I think it stands for large file system, but I'm not I, uh, large file storage, um, and it basically gives you versioning on on binary assets. It's a little like Perforce has been around for a long time. You probably, if you're a small team and you've had somebody who works in DevOps or on production or whatever at a studio, they probably know how to use Perforce. It's not particularly complicated to set. It's it requires a fair amount of touching, but it isn't it isn't complicated touching if that makes sense. Sure. Um, uh, and and also, as with many things, the fact that you're that most of the people you'll hire in know how to probably use Perforce is is important. Um, uh, the, the, the big thing you get from source control is the ability to roll stuff back. So if you make a change, you don't like it, you can say, okay, I only want to do this part of this change or, or whatever. Perforce does that. The knock against Perforce is it's expensive. Like you get GitHub both from a, from a licensing perspective per user and from a hosting it perspective, it can be, it can be pretty unwieldy. Part of that is because game assets get large. You know, our, I think at one point our Perforce repo was two terabytes. Um, because we had versions of, of all sorts of old versions of different stuff and weird offshoot projects and all sorts of other stuff. Um, uh, you, but you can't self-host it. So you can put it on a machine in your premises, then you're responsible for figuring out how to back it up and all that stuff. But, but it is a, it is a thing you can do. Um, you can also put it on like a 300, $300 a month colo machine someplace and, and it'd probably be fine. Um, it's free. It's one of those things. It's free for the first five people, and then once you go beyond that, then you have to you have to talk to somebody, and they're like, "Okay, here's what we're going to charge you." Um, <laughs> Call for a quote. If you have to ask, you know, you're you're in too deep. Uh, but it, it's it's reliable and good, and it's what most game studios use. Is okay. my understanding. If if you if they can afford it, um, they actually built an add on for the engineers so that you can just interface with your Perforce repo through Git now which I thought was pretty funny. So you that's, can, that's, you can, that's pretty good. That, you that, can do your, your that, Git commits into Perforce now. That's yeah. That's like the, that's the build environment equivalent of using the Vim bindings in VS code. It, it, it really and truly is. Um, yeah. And, and uh, I, I mean, that's kind of it. It's source control, man. It's important. So but, uh, here's but, my question. Yeah. Who, who manages all of this stuff? Because between the source control and the build server, it seems like you would need a full time person just to focus on doing all of this. Well, so it's it's one of those things that like when we set up the company and when we first started doing day, nightly builds, uh, one of our engineers set all this stuff up. Right. OK. Maybe maybe, um, maybe it is automated enough that you'd actually I mean, I, I was I was asking that somewhat facetiously because I'm. I was expecting an answer of like, yeah, it sure would be nice to have somebody to focus on just this, but like maybe, maybe it actually is more sustainable it's, than it, it used to be. It's more, than it sounds. Well, so for a long time we were doing a cloud host for the Perforce, which was expensive, but nice. Cause it meant we didn't have to do any server maintenance stuff. Um, the, the server maintenance it's, it's, it's not turnkey, but it's like, Hey, you can spend a couple hours a month working on something and it's probably fine. Yeah. Um, if something breaks, then that, that everything stops while you fix that. That's, that's right? kind of what I was thinking about. And this is a weird tangential example, but it made me think back to which Pixar was it? Toy Story two, I think. Toy, Toy they, Story two. Yeah. I Toy Story two. Like you can go read about this. There are articles like from the time describing this, like they basically lost the movie. There's a bonus feature. There's a short on oh, the DVD. Yes. It's on YouTube. I think you guys did tested, did some stuff around that, didn't you? I, I, think, I, I thought um, I saw some, I thought I saw some tested work cited. I was reading about Wes, that. When they posted it, Wes did a, did a short post about right. it, I believe. That's, that's, that's what I was thinking of. Um, Anyway, like the whole studio ground to a halt because like it was all hands on deck trying to recover stuff, work that had been lost. So yeah. I was just thinking along those same lines, if, if something bad happens where backups need to be restored or X, Y, Z, it seems like having somebody who is permanently on top of that situation would be better than having to like pull people off of their actual work to fix things. 
Well, yeah, but also you have to pay that person the yeah, time when there's nothing bad happening. So of course, pros and cons. Of um, it, it's, it's, it's again, this is one of those places where like being a Swiss army knife is sometimes useful. Cause if, yeah. if like you're looking for an indie studio job and somebody's like, Hey, what else do you know? Besides like the thing that you do 29 days at 20 days a month. And they're like, Oh, well, I, you know, you ran the performance server at my last studio. It's like, Oh, okay. Um, I love PowerShell. Somebody says, I love PowerShell scripting in a job interview. You're like, fuck yes. You're then, my boy. And then back away slowly. Yeah, no. And then you never talk to that person again. Cause they're, uh, so, and then, the, so I was gonna say the last thing that people don't think about, I think often is that you have to have some core source of truth, right? So okay. you need, you need a place that everyone has access to that you put your documentation for how to do stuff in the game. So for example, if you want to put a new sound into well, wise, here's the process for doing that with our game, because it's different for every single game on the face of the earth, because when you get wise, you get access to source code and people make source code changes and they build tools that work specifically with your type of game. And like our game has a bazillion lines, external lines of dialogue that are triggered by things that happen in gameplay. And rather than like wise isn't set up for that. So we have a system that that triggers that in the game and then hands off the audio file to trigger to wise. And then wise just plays the audio file. That's a completely non-standard way to do that. Normally you would just put the dialogue into wise and then build a bunch of independent triggers. And it would, it would have been an unbelievable amount of work on our end to, to hook all that up. I mean, I, I can tell you from having fiddled with the zillion open source projects at this point, and also like having recently done a couple of very small utilities myself, like it seems very easy to build bespoke functionality and then not document how to use it. Oh, look, I, I, I don't want to pick on the person who did this because they they started on the right path and then got distracted and did something else, which happens a lot at small studios. Um, but <laughs> I was looking for how to how to add this the other day and I got and I went to the the wiki page for it. And the thing I saw was this page is a stub. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, everyone loves a stub. Yeah, everybody loves a stub. But, but um, so you, so you want so you want a core source of truth for both documentation. You want to also have like work that needs to be done, a place to put tasks that's shared across the team because there's a lot of stuff that anybody can do or any subset of the team can do. Um, and you just want to have a bin of things to work on. Like so the way we often would work is if we had a four month loop on a patch on a big patch, we would spend two months work, two weeks working on the, on the, to say a, a four week loop on a patch, we would spend two weeks working on features. And then the third week would be all the bugs that we found in that time period. in that month, in that two weeks would go into a bug bin. And then the engineers and the artists and everybody who, who didn't have other stuff to be doing would just sit and just mow down those, those lists of bugs. Um, and they'd grab the first one out of the pool that they looked like they knew how to fix and, and, and tackle it. Is that, is that, I, I assume that's where terms like agile and scrum come in. Those are just different philosophies for managing, uh, or for tackling project management and flow and scheduling and stuff. So yeah, they're, they're higher concept than that. They're like, um, they're, they're more like, it's like, uh, if you think about, uh, like, like personal organization and scheduling, like the, the 40 boxes or whatever that thing like it's 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 their their frameworks in which you can manage a team's time across uh disciplines right so uh, agile the, i think the core I, i'm bad at this because this isn't the side of the stuff i ever do um but i think the idea of agile is that you ship every x period of time and you build like you devote certain percentage of that time to to do stuff and a certain percentage of that time to fixing bugs and a certain percentage of that time to, to doing scrum is a different is okay, a little I, different approach I'm, I'm throwing out clearly jargon that i yeah i can't cannot uh, well define myself but, but but the point is there are like a lot there are entire modes of thinking built around uh making this stuff more efficient yeah this is all stuff days. that came from somebody reading the mythical man month 20 yes. years ago yes i remember and, hearing about that book in the 90s from game developers or yeah seeing them talk about it yeah and well the idea of the mythical man month is that y um if you uh if you have a project that's going to take one person two months and you add two people it's going to take three months instead of two months <laughs> instead of one month <laughs> sure um 
So, so yeah, like, like the, the idea is that there, you have to build in some way to communicate and some way to share information. And that's what a lot of these tools are for. So yeah. like we use, uh, a lot of people use wikis. Confluence is just like a hosted wiki platform that's private and you can build docs in relatively easily. People use notion and stuff like that for that as well. Trello. I feel, I feel like Trello picked up some steam because like when Epic launched the, the Epic store, they published their Trello board publicly for people to look at, to see what they were working on. So publishing public Trello boards was very popular like five years ago. Um, and people, and it's just become a thing that people do. If you're, especially if you're an early access title or something like that, it's good to have a public Trello because people understand it. Trello is more in the task management side. Uh, so like the, the idea, Trello, Jira, stuff like that, uh, are, are, are what often do that. And they, um, th like with them, you do, uh, you, br you break down individual tasks and subtasks. So for example, in the, like our building a new character model aspect, you'd have a, a, tr a Trello or a Jira task that was, Hey, add, add character model X to the game. Right. And then there'd be subtasks for concept, creating the character model, rigging the model, doing, doing the base animations you need to get in the game, adding the gameplay design, adding it to the game and hooking it up to the spawn tables and stuff like that. Um, depending on how big the team is, that can be anywhere from like a thing that somebody does as part of their job. Or if you have a conscientious small team, you can just, everybody can just do it. Everybody just manages their own stuff. And then you go through and work down the list together. Um, if you have a like Ubisoft size, you know, Assassin's Creed team, I assume they have like 20 people at each studio that do that work, right? Like they have people on the individual teams, they have a, a some sort of core or like if anybody at Ubisoft wants to share how you do this, I'm fascinated by it because it is seems like a nightmarish job, but like they, I'm sure they hand out tasks like make Rome to, to Ubisoft <laughs> Shanghai. Right. And and then there are notes in there that of places that have to exist. It has to have the Coliseum. It has to have the, the blah, blah, blah. And, um, from there, from there, the individual teams at the individual studios parse out what they're working on. And, and like, because of the scale of that art and the size of that art, I'm sure that like, you know, Ubisoft Shanghai works on one part of the map and somebody works on a different part of the map. And same thing for like Fortnite. Fortnite has a bazillion contributors for it now. Um, yeah. It's so, so like that, that people call that a producer is, is what it often ends up being. Um, uh, but those are folks that manage the Trello, manage the Jira, manage the Confluence and and help help keep the whole team on time. Honestly, having a good Jira, well-populated Jira with the actual tasks and stuff helps you know how much time stuff's going to take more than anything else. Because you like, I mean, they're always outliers and like a bug that'll take one person four days to figure out or a week to figure out. But often it's just like, like if, if it's adding, like if it's building a new map for the game, you know, that's going to be a month right for for an environment artist and that's all they're going to do that month and you can just I mean put that down and know that that's what they're going to do and then God. it'll be another three months to pretty that that up yeah after they've done the first pass that's that's so crazy to think about like again i know i keep referencing this but coming off that romero book reading about some of his stories about like staying up all night and making an entire doom map like it's just like oh, i just decided to stay up all night and by the by 6 a.m i had a finished map that ended up in doom 2 you know like just the the complexity, the increase, the orders of magnitude increase in complexity in, in building things like environments in the well, last 20, 30 years. Yeah. And moving from 2D to 3D was a big one. But then the thing about the fidelity, like I think what Quake 1 characters were like 300 polys or something. Um, so, you know, you think about that versus a normal mapped modern first person shooter game character that's a million polys effectively. Like it's it's not it's not it's if, if you this is why if you want to make a game with a small team you don't make something that looks like metal gear solid five right, or right. or or call of duty or whatever it's because yeah. it's too many people yeah. there there are more people making guns in call of duty than working on most indie teams i think at this point so that that checks out yeah i mean that's why the guns are all animated and cool and like that's when when they do those cool animations where like the guy is running and he kind of looks at his gun as he's running he holds up and he does something you've never seen him do before somebody spent a month working on that <laughs> i'm guessing that's a month that a lot of smaller studios don't have seems like a bad way to spend your money yeah. um 
so yeah, Trello is good. It gives you public visibility. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's important to have that shared source of truth so that if somebody gets hit by a bus or somebody doesn't have time to like, it's honestly, it's just nice. So you don't have to go ask the person who knows how to do everything, how to do everything to have those documentation, have that yes. documentation. Yes, absolutely. You're, you're buying future time for yourself when you write good docs. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, that, that, so that's it. I, there's a ton of stuff we didn't talk about here that other people, and, and, and also the important thing to think about with games, every single game is different from every other game, including like sequels inside the same studios. Everybody has different processes. What is a producer at one job is a publisher at a different one. And like, there's, there's all sorts of like, it's de DevOps stuff is crazy. This is, this kind of all lives under the shell of DevOps, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. It's a, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. I don't think I've heard a whole lot of people talk about it uh, publicly. So it's, oh. it's maybe, maybe our nerdy audience will enjoy it. I hope you like this. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, hopefully this gives some insight into the, just the kind of nuts and bolts part of getting a video game out the door. Yeah, the, the the big thing for me was realizing that like, oh, right, realistically, most of the time when you make a change to the game, you're not going to get to test it in the game until the next day at the earliest. So that's a that's a it's not like you press press compile and then it's on your the test version of your iPhone in 10 minutes. Like, right. you know, a, yeah. like a phone app. Yes. So anyway, making game games, dev, uh -huh. making games. Uh -huh. Nobody should do it. Every oh. game is a miracle. <laughs> Whoa. All right. no, no. Making games is I, I enjoy making games, but it is it is we're pushing a patch this morning, actually. Look, you're 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 not the first nor the 10th developer. I've heard say something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> pretty widely held opinion. Literally, the fact that any game ever ships is a surprise to me. Yes. When, when somebody ships a game, they're like, how did they ship this when it had this many bugs? And I'm like, man, I know exactly how that happened. Uh, at some point, you got to get it out the door. But yes. um, but yeah. Uh, so if you have questions, feel please send them in. We'll answer them on the next Q&A at techpod at content.town or the question seeking answers channel on the Discord. And if you're not in the Discord and would like to be in the Discord, you can do so by becoming a fabulous TechPod patron. You can. Uh, yeah, everyone. This is Brad. Did you know this is a listener supported show? I've, well, I've heard. I saw a friend of the pod talking about advertising, uh, Jeff Gersman talking about advertising on his blue sky yesterday. And I was like, man, I don't want to have to deal with advertising because all like, look, all it's going to do is annoy people into signing up for the patrons, so Patreon. So they get the ad free version. I'd rather just ask them to support the podcast nicely and say, hey, if you, do, you know, we, we'd rather not have to annoy anyone. We'd rather just have no ads is where I land. Yeah. Um, uh, and you can support the pa the podcast by going to patreon.com slash tech pod. Again, it's patreon.com slash tech pod. And because you have to say everything three times, I'm going to say it again. <laughs> Wait, Patreon I can say it. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, so what is it, Brad? Is it patreon.com slash tech pod? It is patreon.com slash tech pod. And you said it four times. Does that now cancel out one of I the think, three? I think more people are going to sign up because we said the fourth. Um, uh, but yeah, so you can go to, you can go to the, the Patreon you can sign up for five bucks a month to get access to the patron exclusive episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, last month we talked about a bunch of stuff. People seem to really like it. It was, it was, uh, it generated a lot of conversation yeah. in the new, uh, episode discussion sub forum. Oh, and it did exactly what you said it might do, which is that people started posting their own tips and I got a tip out of there yesterday that made me very happy. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, and yeah, for five bucks, you can join that. You can join our our ranks of ex executive producer tier patrons. So we thank every month, including mm -hmm. Nick Johnston, Paddle Creek Games, makers of Fractured Veil. Vale. That's coming out on October, by the way. Now, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Andrew Slosky, Jordan Lippett, Bunny Fiend, Just Wedge 3.0, Joel Krauska, Twinkle Twinkie, David Allen, James Kamek and Pantheon, makers of the HS3 high speed 3D printer. Thank you all so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. One and all. Um, and that'll do it for us this week. We'll be yeah. back next week. I think yeah, next week we might talk about iOS stuff, huh? Because oh, it's time. Uh, I've, I've got another idea. Oh, we'll, we'll talk about foreshadow. It. Okay, we'll yeah, talk about it offline. Let's, let's let's. It's a milestone. Let's say. We'll, oh, oh my. We'll, we'll we'll discuss and we'll see what we come up. We would. Yeah, new iOS is is imminent. We, we should yeah, talk it's, about that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm toying with installing the beta. I don't know if it's a good idea or not. Ugh. ugh. <laughs> They're not usually beta anymore by this point. Mm. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Through this exploit that just happened. Well, well fair. Fair. Okay, we'll see you all next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.